Proverbs 11. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. When pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of the transgressors shall destroy them. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness deliver from death. Now, in these verses, the book of Proverbs, I have to say it, ask the teens, I said it last week during teens class, Proverbs is a peculiar, but also a very, or it may not have been last week in the teens class, it was about two weeks ago, I can't remember now. Anyway, Proverbs, peculiar book in that sometimes one verse stands by itself. It doesn't have any other verses to go in context with it. A verse can stand alone. Sometimes half a chapter will be one verse. I mean, will be one thought. More than one verse, but a singular thought. It just goes and expounds upon that one thought. The first ten chapters of the book of Proverbs are one narrative talking about how nobody seeks after wisdom anymore. And Solomon personifies wisdom as a woman, says that she stands at the gates and she calls out and cries for people to come and listen to her, but nobody wants to hear it. And Solomon's saying, we need to get back to wisdom. And then he talks about how wisdom is truth, and truth comes from God. And that's the only wisdom that we can have is what comes from God, the truth of God. Well, then here in verse number, or chapter number 11, verse number 1, he starts talking about, first, an abomination. A false balance is abomination to the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. Well, what's that talking about? Well, it's talking about the same thing that is on my necklace. Scales. Old-timey scales. Not the kind where you step on it and then a little digital number that you don't like pops up on it. Because that number's probably bigger than you thought it was going to be. I have done many of that lately. Anyway, point is... Back in the day, scales were very rudimentary, but very effective things. You had one plate on this side, or a bowl, you had another dish on this side, and then they were connected via one bar. And you would put a weight on one side, and then you would ration out whatever it is that you were selling of that weight. Well, some people used a false weight. Well, what's that? Well, if you wanted it to be heavier than what it said on there, so for instance, if I'm trying to get a good deal, I would say, well... It'll be made of iron on the outside, but we'll fill it with lead so that it's actually heavier than what the outside of it says it is. Or if you were trying to rip somebody off, you'd take a weight and hollow out the inside of it so that you'd get a more favorable deal. Well, I'm going to sell you five pounds, but really I only sold you four and a half pounds because I drilled out some of the weight. But you think that I sold you five pounds. Well, what's that? It's an abomination to the Lord. It was one of the first commandments that he gave. I shall not bear false witness. What is it? It's false witness. It's defrauding. Right? But there's maliciousness behind it. A false weight is something that you are gaining by doing harm to others. Some people gain by doing harm to themselves. But how much more of an abomination is it to God when you gain by doing harm to others? When you take advantage. When you esteem yourself higher than others and as a result don't care what you do to others that's where verse number 2 comes in when pride cometh then cometh shame not just those that use a false balance or a false weight but anybody when pride cometh may not initially brother Josh we know that there's pleasure in sin for a season and is pride always a sin well no but a haughty spirit cometh before a fall Right, Just like it's not sin to have the thought of anger, it's sin to act on that thought. Pride is not an act in and of itself, but it's something that can cause you to do a whole lot of wrong. Just like anger is something... Sun's not supposed to set on our wrath, we're supposed to be angry and sin not, but anger can cause us a whole lot of problems if we don't rein in the flesh as we're supposed to. Same comes with pride. But pride cometh then come a shame eventually you're going to get caught with a false weight Amen. somebody's going to come along and say you know what it's not that I don't trust you I just don't trust anybody so let me use my own weights let's put my weight on there and see what it comes out to 
and then we'll put your weight on there. And then if they take your set of false weights to the gate and say, hey, this guy tried to rob me. Back in the day, penalties were a little bit more severe than they are nowadays. Back in the day, they may take someone's hand as a reminder, not just to him, but to everybody else. He tried to take what was not his, so as a reminder, we took the thing that he tried to grab with. Or they may put him in the equivalent of the stocks, like they did Jeremiah, where he's out there and people are mocking him openly, rebuking him, saying, hey, where's your God now that you're on display? But in this case, people would be coming by and saying, hey, you remember that thing you sold me? I wonder how much you got off of me. I wonder how much you ripped me off. I wonder how much of that fancy house that that guy has I bought with money that he shouldn't have had. What is it? Well, pride will come, but then eventually shame's going to show up. And here's the thing about shame. Shame can either be open or private. God can cause you shame through conviction. That's what conviction is. It is the convincing of God that I have done something that I ought not have done. Before we got saved, we were convinced that our sin was the reason that Jesus was hung on a cross and shed his blood for us. It brought shame to our current sinful state, but also enlightened me that there was a state that was better than that. What's to say? But with the lowly is wisdom. When you got low or when you got humbled before God, that's when God was able to show you that there is a better way. You got wise to the fact that salvation was an option. But why do you think the Bible says that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into heaven? Because pride puffeth up. Pride boasteth of himself and he thinks that he doesn't have need of anything. He isn't humbled because he looks around at everything that his hands have attained and he's not impressed with what Jesus could do for him. You say, that's not always the case. No. But it's a difficult thing to set aside pride. It takes an act of God to help you set aside pride. If you truly shirk it, get rid of it. If you repent of it. But, I can't tell if it's the humidity or because of what we're talking about. Y'all about to die. Verse number three. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. The upright, like Job, that fear God and shoot evil. The Bible said he was a perfect man, an upright man. But what does an upright man do? He allows God to decide for him. The integrity of the upright. The integrity means if I know that there's a better way, there's something in me that won't do anything but the right way. Regardless of whether it does me harm, if it's what's right, I'm going to do it. If I messed up, I'm going to pay the price. I'm not going to try and finagle my way out of responsibility. But at the same time, if I'm owed something, I may forgive it for my integrity's sake. For instance, let's do... What's the word I'm looking for here? A hypothetical. I almost said a hyperbole. That wasn't what I was looking for. Hypothetical situation. Let's say the brother Tommy wanted to start a company. And I gave him... Let's say he wanted to start a company back in November. Solid business plan. Made sense. Right? I prayed over it. God told me to give him the money as an investment. I'm not doing the work. He's going to do the work, but he needed the capital to do it. Well, you're in trouble if you're coming for me looking for money, Brother Tommy. But let's say I had it and I gave it to him. Remember, I prayed on it. God gave me peace on it. In the event that all this stuff that's going on right now happened, Brother Tommy, a brand new startup business, things aren't looking good for the new startup business right about now. Now let's say as a condition of my loan, I said that payments had to start coming in three months after. Well, that would have been March. Could have been February if I gave it to him in November. Right? My integrity says he didn't do anything wrong. God knew this was going to happen beforehand. God's the one that told me to give it to him. So maybe after all this bailout and everything that they're talking about, which I still haven't seen any paper, they just say, well, we know who needs to get what. I don't trust them. I want some paperwork. I want to be able to file for, for, for some stuff, especially at the business. Be like, hey, I want to be able to pay people. I want to be able a month from now when money isn't coming in, 
to be able to pay the bills. But they say, well, we know. Well, okay. But in Brother Tommy's case, I know he didn't do nothing wrong. He kept me apprised of it. God's going to provide a way. So in my integrity, even though on the piece of paper, I have a thing that says, well, I could take his car as collateral. Or I could put a garnishment on any future wages that he owes. My integrity might say, Brother Tommy, don't worry about it. Just keep working on it. And God's going to take care of it. But you say, well, that's not the letter of the law. Well, no, sometimes integrity says you don't take what's yours. For the grace, for the mercy that was showed to us, we show it to others. Because let's be honest, Brother Tommy's going to have to pay for some of that, but you know who else is? Sister Christina. Little Lucas. They're the ones that are going to have to pay for it also. And it wasn't like he was an infidel, not out there providing for his family. Is that something that God knew was going to happen? Happen. And if I loved them enough to give them the loan because God told me to, can't I love them enough to help them get through this? That's integrity. It guides our actions. Well, where do we find out what's right? Right here. How do you get it? Through lowliness, humility. You'll find wisdom in the pages of God to direct your life and guide it. But the perverseness of the transgressors shall destroy them, just like that false weight, the false scale, the false balance. What will that do? Well, eventually, your perverseness, your greed, your love of money, which is the root of all evil, the perverseness of your scale eventually will destroy you. Now, say, let's say Brother Tommy went and got a loan from somebody else, and he did maliciously in his business practices. He may get away for it for a while, but eventually, it will destroy that company. He's going to owe money to some, like a pyramid scheme, Ponzi scheme. Y'all ever heard of them? They could fool people for a while and keep giving the first investors their dividends by the money that other people are putting in afterwards, but eventually the money runs out because they're not investing it like they said they would. You're not really getting returns. They're just giving you all the money that's coming into the company so that they can run away with your millions while other people are giving them thousands. Eventually it catches up to them. If you don't believe me, go look at Enron. That's a funny story. Not for those that got swindled, but in hindsight, what was it? It was a, it was a scheme. It wasn't real. The perverseness of the transgressors shall destroy them. Riches doth, or riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness deliver from death. Rich can't buy your own soul. Some people say that they sold their soul to the devil. Your soul isn't even yours to sell. It's already cursed. It has an abode already in the charred region of the dam without Christ. It's already destined to go, not because God destined you to go there, but because there's no other place for you to go. To be separate from God is to be forever estranged and never allowed to enter into the realms of holiness. But those that have righteousness, says, but righteousness delivers from death. It doesn't say our righteousness. But righteousness, because I don't have righteousness. My righteousness is his filthy rags. I have no righteousness, but I can't be robed in his righteousness. It is the blood of Christ that delivereth from death. It was faith that one day a deliverer would come in the Old Testament, and by that faith they lived according to what thus saith the Lord. That's what allowed them to enter into paradise, Abraham's bosom, until Christ came and led captivity captive. They had to be robed in righteousness. Because they had none of their own. They just by faith believed God. And what does the book of Hebrews and the hall of faith tell us? That faith, it was imputed righteousness because of their faith. God looked ahead in time and said one day they will be robed in righteousness. So we'll allow them to go to paradise until that righteousness can be given to them. They were waiting on what we got the moment that we bowed our heads and said, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And when they got it, they got to go. Led, led captivity. He said, all right, everybody in, let's go. And he took them on to glory. But we're not going to teach on any of that. Back to verse number one. A false balance is abomination to the Lord. That word abomination, it means that it causes sickness. 
when over in the book of Revelation, when he told the church of Laodicea that he would spew them out of his mouth. Why? Because they were lukewarm. They were neither cold nor hot. He couldn't do anything with them. Well, here, that was disgust. Here, it's an abomination. He hates it. Can't stand the taste of it. An abomination is the Lord looks at it and it's only by his long suffering, his mercy, and his grace that he doesn't wipe it off the face of the earth then. The things that happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, abomination. And if he poured out hellfire and brimstone upon them, in the wrath, I mean, what did verse number say? Or verse number four say? But riches profited not in the day of wrath. The day that God pours out his wrath, he pours it out on abominations. In a false way, deceit, lying, or lying to yourself is an abomination in the eyes of God. A false balance where you're not looking at things the right way. You're trying to tilt the odds into your favor. You may even be lying to God in order to do that. So with the help of the Lord this morning, we're going to teach on how do you weigh things? How do you weigh things? Because again, scale, you put a weight on one side and then you measure it out on the other. There are a lot of people today that are saved on their way to heaven, but they got the wrong viewpoint. They're weighing things the wrong way. Let's just first off, let's start with how do you weigh others? Now, again, not perfect. Going to say, guilty of this one. Had to preach to myself on this. Right, but how much mercy and grace do you show to others? How much love do we really exhibit to others? Do we put others to a different standard than the one that Christ put to us? Because he showed us love. He showed us mercy. He showed us grace. So when I look at others, do I try to look at them as Christ sees them? Or do I hold them to a different standard than what God showed to me? I'm not just talking about taking the gospel to them. I'm talking about in daily life. The Bible does say that we ought to turn the other cheek. That we should go the extra mile. And in that passage, it says, If a man compel thee to go with him a mile. You know what that means? You don't want to do it, but you got to do it anyway. Willingly go the extra mile because you didn't have a choice to say whether you wanted to go on the first one. So just show them that even if you didn't have to, you would have gone anyway. Do we treat others that way? If the boss compels you to go a mile, do you go twain? Well, no, because he pays me to do what I do. Well, everything that I did paid for Jesus' cross and the nails that went into his hands. It's not about me, it's about him. How do I put my life on the scale? I'm supposed to be the light of the world. I'm supposed to be the salt of the earth. I'm supposed to be a written epistle known and read of all men. But here's the thing. When I get into that secret place, whether it's laying my head down on my pillow, whether it's a prayer closet, whether it's in the car, because that's the only place I can get away from other people, wherever it is for you, where you sit down and you start thinking about the things in your life, when God starts dealing with you about certain things, do you bring out your own scale? And do you say... Well, I, I spread a little bit of salt this week. I bore a little bit of fruit this week. But I do believe the commandment was that we're supposed to bear much fruit. Not some fruit. And much for you may be different for somebody else. It takes a whole lot of strawberries to make up for one pumpkin. Right? Some fruit weighs a little bit more. It takes a little bit longer to grow. Good luck trying to find enough strawberries to weigh the same as a watermelon. Right? It's not in our eyes. One watermelon is much fruit. You can feed a bunch of people with that. But it may not last long. But it will satisfy some for now. They can taste and see that the Lord is good. But when I put on the scale, do I try to say that my two strawberries are all that I could bear that week for the Lord? If it is, then you're in the clear. Maybe it's a time of hardness. Maybe some coldness has come into your life. But you want to know where I find the true measurement? Right here. This is where the true balance is. This 
is beholding my face in a glass so that I see what I really am. And here's the thing. In here, I also find whether or not the Lord's pleased with it. It's a great feeling when you see yourself and you say, I have been doing that. And God says, I'm proud of you. He puts a seal of approval on your life and says, you're okay there. But when the subject changes and says, well, you passed that test, now let's work on this one. Do you try and put your own balance up and say, well, Lord, I just passed that test. I'm good right now. We don't need to worry about that right now. Well, according to who? I mean, we are one when it comes to the church. We're supposed to have love one for another. That's how the world would know that we were his disciples. But if I love him as he loved me, I will love those that maybe in the flesh, maybe in my own pride, maybe before I got saved, I just said, them people don't deserve God. I'll love them anyway. I'll love them on purpose like God loved me on purpose. But if I put my own scale out, I'll say, well, I, I'll go and I'll be courteous to them. Show me where the Bible says courtesy. That we're to be, you know, cordial to other people. No, we're supposed to love others. And I've said before, love implies that I give up something to be associated with them. Maybe I've got to nail my pride to that cross that I'm supposed to take up every day and follow after him. But once I nail that pride there, I will go associate. To, I gave up part of myself to take the gospel to other people. If you love somebody, you may give up financially. You may give up your time. You may give up energy. You may give up sleep for some people because you're lifting their name up to the Lord in prayer. Saying, Lord, I don't need sleep, but they need you. But if I pull out my own balance, I'm not going to do them things. Why? Because that's going to cost me. I'm trying to get a good deal out of this. But, next. How's your balance when you come to the altar? Some people don't even see the value in the altar, so they just ignore it. But the altar is the place where things die. We've heard that preached around here before. But when you come to the altar, God may ask or show you that you need to give more than what you're willing to let go of. If you get up without having get let loose of whatever God told you to let loose of, it's because you've got a false balance. You have rationalized in your own head that you don't need to give up what God told you you need to give up. Because you know what dies on the altar? I do. Why do I have to die so that Christ can live in me? I die daily so that Christ which rose again, can live through me. But he can't do that if I've got things in the way. He can't do that if through pride I've taken the reins of my life back. And I assure you that if I take the reins of my life, it's not through integrity. It's through pride, it's through bitterness, it's through jealousy, envy, maliciousness. Could be for a whole bunch of things. But you know what the end thereof is? It will destroy me. The altar is the place that I stay alive by giving up the flesh. Spiritually, I live when I don't embrace the flesh. Man can have, cannot have two masters. I love one and hate the other. If I choose the flesh, I'm already dying spiritually. When I, take the, when I use the false balance on the altar, I say, well, Lord, you really don't need me to give that up. God doesn't need us to do anything, but He desires it so that we get closer to Him. You know what was predestinated for all those that may listen to this and are a tad bit Calvinistic? You know what was predestinated? Those that He foreknew, meaning those that He knew would trust in His Son. It was predestinated that they be conformed to the image of His Son. That's what was predestinated. If you got saved, you ought to look like Christ. That's what was set in stone. When he became the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, it was decided or predestined before the beginning of the world that all those that came to God through Christ should look like Christ. Because he was altogether lovely. There was no fault in him. That's why he was able to become our perfect lamb. So why wouldn't we want to be like somebody? That was altogether perfect. 
He's so perfect that by him and through him do all things consist. Because he was there when everything was made and without him nothing was made. But if I bring my balance out, not only when I come to the altar am I not going to die, if I bust my balance out, well, how much do I really think that I should look like Jesus? Do you know how the Bible says that we're engraved in the palm of his hands over there in Isaiah? Dad preached on that Wednesday night. He referenced that verse. Well, he ought to be engraved in every aspect of our life because we are engraved in the palm of his hands. I should be like a coin. I mean, here you go. Here's an analogy. This may take us the rest of the class, but hopefully it'll help you. God just said to use it. When you take silver or gold out of the ground, it's dirty. It's contaminated. A lot of times, precious you know, metals, they run through their veins in other types of rock or other types of dirt. You know what you got to do to get that gold? You got to clean it. Sometimes you got to bust up the rocks of the other stuff to get to what's good on the inside. Well, what happened when you got saved? He reached down into the miry clay and brought you out of it and separated you from the filth that you were in because he saw value in you. And then what did he do? Well, he put it through them washers, the hoppers. If you've ever seen any of them Gold Rush shows on the History Channel like I have. And you know what he puts into that hopper? Water. Well, I know that there's the washing of the water of the Word, and I know there's the washing of the water of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God do enough work on you. All those contaminants will get out, and when He goes back to the hopper, all that's going to be there is that gold. Then you've got to take all them little tiny pieces of gold, because remember, He had to break it up in order to get all the impurities out. You're not going to be what Christ wants you to be unless you're broken. Because it's only through brokenness that He can get those deep things that are inside of us and remove them that hinder us from living the life that we're supposed to live for Him. Well, after all those broken pieces are collected, what do you have to do? You've got to melt them down. You've got to make all those pieces into one thing. Well, what's that? Well, sometimes the fire gets turned up so that people can say, ah, he's just a little, there's a little bit of good in him, but they don't see all the pieces that God sees. They may see a little fleck or a little sparkle but God, I mean, Job said, though he try me, I shall come forth as gold. He's saying, I know what God's put in me, and I know what I'm going to come out on the other side. People will not just see the little pieces. They'll see everything at once that God put in me. Well, it's that if I can stand the fire, if I can pass the test, others will see that Jesus put value in me. He turned me into something that I was not on my own. He made me into something new. Not dirt, not miry clay. He may be into something precious, a vessel of honor for him. But what happens after you get all them little flakes into one thing? Well, then you can mold it. You can turn it into what you want to turn it into. But, in this instance, we're going to talk about old, old, old coins. Nowadays, they got mills and they got machines and it does it all for you. But, in this time, and times after this, for many, many years, you would take that valuable coin. It was blank on both sides. It was just a disc of silver, gold, copper, whatever it was that you were using. It was a blank disc. It had no identity. It had no association. But somebody would put it on a little holder, and he had a big old hammer. And he'd swing it up over his shoulder. And if he hit it just right, it would leave the impression from the front of the hammer and the bottom of the holder, the other die. And when he removed the hammer, it had what it was supposed to have on it on both sides. Well, see, God doesn't strike us because he doesn't want to hurt it, but he does do a little bit of engraving. Because before you ever get to that first coin, you've got to do a blank or a mold, a cast. You know how you do that? First, you take one and you engrave out what you want. Then you put that. Usually it was made out of wax or clay. 
and you would put that in the sand and you'd pour in molten iron it'd blow up or evaporate all the wax consume it all or the clay and what was left behind was something solid that looks like what that wax used to be well what was that well Jesus which was holy was poured, in, poured into a mold or a cast of flesh to become what we needed so that we could look like him Saying that's dirt, dust. He was robed in dust to become what we needed to be identified with the Father. Because here's the thing. I don't care what kind of currency you got. You take out a penny in your pocket right now, you take out a dollar bill. You know what it's going to have on there? It's going to have a few things. First, there's going to be a signature on there. That shows you that what you're holding was authorized by the people that were authorized to make it. Usually it's the Secretary of the Treasury. You know what I'm saying? The government decided that we were going to print money and this is one of them bills. Well, you've got a signature on you that says purchased on Calvary. But if I've got that balance out, I don't see the value in being associated with them. I don't want that signature on my... I don't want people to see it. But see, another thing on a piece of currency, there's going to be a name that identifies you with the country that you belong to. I'm not a member of this world. I have a name on me but you know whose name it is it's heaven he said he was going to prepare a place it's got my address stamped on me already I don't even know what it is but he does it's got the land that I come and here's the thing you can take a dollar bill from the US and it's so valuable that you can go to a different country and you can exchange it but here's the thing I can't be exchanged Nothing that anybody can do to turn me into something else other than what God wants me into. Why? Because it's been engraved on me, stamped on me, so that I am identified with Him. But then, there's another thing. There's a serial number on dollar bill. Not so much change, but on bills. Why? You can lose every bit of that bill except for those serial numbers, and you can take it to a bank, put it into your bank account. They may look at you a little funny, but if it all checks out, if they look at the numbers and, well, yeah, that one's out there. It hadn't been destroyed because they log all that kind of stuff. You can still put it into the bank. I can lose everything about me except for that identify, identifying number. Well, what's that number? That's the blood that he put on my life to cleanse me. As long as I got the blood, I'm sealed. I'm still got value to God. I may get a little burnt, may get washed in the washer a few times, but still have value to go. You can still do something with somebody that holds on to their identity. Why? Because the integrity of the upright won't let them be associated with anything else but God. Another thing about money. You know that the ink on your dollar bills never dries? I don't know how they do that but it doesn't you can wash it and it's still going to be there it stains which is why you can see it but don't dry there's nothing that this world can do nothing that I can do nothing in heaven that can ever cause that blood to dry out on my life Amen. then nowadays because counterfeits there's counterfeits back in Jesus' day he said that false Christ and false you know, salvation, false churches, false prophets would arise. But nowadays, you look into it, it's not paper, it's cotton, it's fabric. Well, how do you get fabric? You've got to weave it. Everything in your life is a weave of things that God has allowed to happen and decisions that you have made based off of what God allowed to happen in your life. And if the blend is right, when people step back, they'll say, oh, that's valuable. Because, I mean, you pull out a $20 bill, hold it up to the light, you're going to see a little plastic strip that went through it that says US 20 on it. Can't see it unless you hold it up to the light. But if you hold some things up to the light, like people, you hold them up to truth, you hold them up based to Christ, you're going to be able to see through them just a little bit to see what's on the inside and show that they're not a counterfeit. 
What's that? That's when the fire gets turned up in your life. My balance may say, Lord, I don't need to be in here right now. My false balance may say, well, Lord, I, why are we doing this? There's no sense in doing right. I let go of my integrity when things get hot. But those that hold on to it, others can see, well, it may be hot, but that fire lets off some light. And I can see in them something different that ain't in me. What is it? That's us being identified with Christ. There's a whole bunch of ways that Monday's identified. A whole bunch of ways that a piece of currency is identified with the people that made it. But here's the thing. This is what's contrary. Doesn't make sense to us, Brother Brian. In order to make a coin, you're taking something that was pure, right, that was holy, and you're removing stuff from it. So that what's left is the identifying mark. But here's the thing. God wasn't impressed with us. There was nothing in us that was good. But he can take what we were, which, granted, isn't what we're going to be. You can make currency out of anything. The only thing that it needs to be agreed upon is that that is from the person that said it was, and it's guaranteed that it's got value to the person that issued it. Well, I may come forth as gold, but until I get to glory, I'm not gold. They may be able to see that, oh, there's value in him, but it's not because of me. It's because of what he put in me. So in order to be identified with him, he takes me, and I've got to allow him to carve out the flesh. Carve out pride. Because that's what engraving is. You're getting rid of something. Well, you say, well... It was white gold, or it was rose gold, or it was pure gold, or silver. Yeah, but it's more valuable once it's identified with someone that has power. Well, who has power? Well, the United States government has power. And they have the power to back all the money that they print. That's why people think it's valuable. But see, the name, that still is, regardless of what all the liberals and hippies and everybody else don't want to admit God is on all your currency well if his name has been engraved in you and it's visible to others to see it because there's a lot of pennies out there that I don't want especially the ones that got crud and everything else on them that you can't even read it I don't want them but sometimes my scales my balances get me to the point that I can live like that and I'm still convinced that people want to use me that people want to be associated with me. Some, some money I look at and I think, that penny has coronavirus. But, but if God removes all that, if God can get into who I am and start removing what he's not pleased with, certainly to God and to other people, they look at me and say, there's value there. I can't deny it. It's stamped into him. Well, my balance says that I don't need a stamp. I'm good the way that I am. My balance brings out pride, which says, no, I'm not going to submit to God. My balance removes my integrity and replaces it with perverseness. Because my balance leans in my favor. My balance is designed. It has one goal and that is to make me better than what I really am. Whether it's I'm paying less money than I should be paying, that's good for me. Whether it's I'm getting more than what I should be getting, that's good for me. But see, this scale, this balance, why do you think so many people in the Bible say, Lord, try me, prove me? What are they saying? Put me on the balance because I want to know what you think of me. That's why they say, Lord, search me. Because I look on the outward appearance, God looks on what's on the inside. And see, those that have integrity, those that will be delivered from destruction and death, those that will live a life that's pleasing unto God, they relinquish their own balance and say, I don't care what I think, I care what God thinks. 
those that put themselves on the balance and said, Lord, try me, weigh me. When they lose ten children and everything that they own in one day, they go back to the altar. When they're thrown into the lion's den, after a law was passed that they knew was unjust and they still lived justly, they had no fear. I, I don't find anywhere where Daniel's kicking and screaming on the way to the lion's den. He went in and said, I'd rather take the lions and lose God. He didn't have his own balance. He had God's balance. And people, I'll say this, I'll be done. People that are so terrified, worked up into hysteria, that they're barricading themselves in houses. I mean, Big Duck told me, he went to Point Blank on a Tuesday morning. No guns and no ammo in the whole store. Why? Because people bought it all. They're freaking out. They're, they're, he went in and talked to the guy. He said, there are people who never owned a gun in their life coming in and buying guns. He said they wouldn't even know how to load it if they had to. What is that? That's no faith. What, is a bullet going to keep you from getting corona? I mean, what? Does somebody really want your toilet paper all that bad that they're going to break into your house? I mean, Christian got three bidets in that. Dad bought one of them, everything but the house crates. And it, came, it had three bidets in it. Christian said, well, if the foster family runs out of toilet paper, we're still good. <laughs> what is it? As people have got the wrong scale. They got the wrong weights that they're putting on the scale. It's a false balance. I find that Daniel had a law passed against him. He just did the right thing. Ask Christian, Sheriff of Boone County. If you live somewhere else other than Boone County, I don't know if this applies to you. But a Sheriff of Boone County said, why would we write people tickets for going and doing things that they feel that they have to do when people aren't working and they can't pay tickets? But what's the point in giving somebody a ticket for driving to a restaurant? Or if they just wanted to take a drive through the country? They ain't got nothing else to do right now. But here's the thing. I don't know about you. I know a lot of people have been laid off. Had to file for unemployment. Even when you get home from work, there's nothing to do. Can't go out and go see a movie. Can't do it. What have we been doing with this time that God gave us? When we put it on the balance, how are we rationalizing it? I was just thinking, what if we gave... The Bible says the tenth is what belongs to God. People like to think of that with money all the time. What if we gave a tenth of us, undevoted, I mean completely devoted, unconditionally to God? It comes out to 144 minutes a day. It's two hours and 24 minutes. What if you just gave that to God... And said, Lord, that time I give to you. Shut everything else off. Get away from faith. Now, I know that's not always possible. Things pop up, right? If somebody gets sick and you got to run them to the hospital. Run them to the hospital. Okay? That's called providential. But what if I spent some of that time in here? Extra on top of what I already do. What if I lifted other people's names up in prayer? What if I just spent it saying, Lord, give me one person? I watched that movie Hacksaw Ridge again the other day. Guy's up there on the hill. He, hands are all charred up from rope burns. He's exhausted. He, all night he's been running trying to get people that were left wounded on a battlefield. He gets back and he lets another one down. His body's quitting on him and he's praying to God, Lord, just let me get one more. Just one more. There were over 100 men that were left up on that battlefield. They thought that they were all dead. He found 75 of them that were alive and let them down off the mountain by himself. Because he was just praying, one more. One more. But what if we said, Lord, just give me one person. Pray for him. And all the time that I could be doing other stuff, but God shut everything down because of Corona. What if I spent that time praying for that person? What if I spent that time asking the Lord, Lord, remove everything from my life that you're not pleased with so that when this whole thing's lifted, I go back, they say, there's something different about him. What happened to you? I did business with God. What'd you do over the past two months? But when you were quarantined, what'd you do? I got closer to God. What'd you do? 
Why? Not for me. But because I want to be associated with him. I want his name stamped in me. I want him engraved in me as much as I'm engraved into the palm of his hands. I'm engraved so well that I'm in his hand, his hands in the fire. No man can pluck me out. I want him engraved so deep in me, no matter what happens in my life, people can still see his fingerprints on my life. But I won't get that if I've got the wrong balance. I won't get that if I'm still using weights that are in my favor. I will get it when I just come to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm yours. Message to Dad, here's my basket. Some people are so paranoid, they're sitting there with all the time that God gave them. Fretting over what the government's going to do next, whether or not that. I don't know why. Pe- when did people get so gullible that a family member can tell them? I, I know people, family members tell them, if you leave the house, the police are going to arrest you. Let them try. I'm going down kicking and screaming, especially if it's on the way to church. They're going to have to chase me here. That may not be a good thing. That's a felony. But. Why? Because I want to be associated with him. Regardless of who wants to be afraid of the big bad wolf. Because if God's bigger than lions, and if God's bigger than the Red Sea, and if God's bigger than everything else in the Bible that he showed man that he's in control of everything, he can take care of me. Even if I get it, I've got faith. That most, I've got faith, one, I'm not even going to know that I have it because it's so mild. But I've also got faith that if I do have it and don't know about it, if I'm in the perfect will of God, he'll keep you from getting it. You say, you're crazy. Maybe. Crazy for Jesus. But what's... If if I don't have faith that God's bigger than COVID-19, how am I going to have faith that moves mountains? I mean, faith the size of a grain of mustard. How small is some people when they're so afraid? Now, I'm not talking about those that are susceptible and they've got risk, and really it would up in their life. I understand taking precaution. God gave us the whole armor of God. God understands precaution. But I'm talking lunacy. People that are healthy as an ox, terrified of stepping outside of their house, like COVID's going to come and smack them upside the back of the head. That it's everywhere. The trees got it. You go outside, you breathe air, you're going to be awful. You're going to die. I'd rather just live in victory because I got the right balances. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.